Ken, um, Ken said to me about this time last year, he doesn't do it very often um, because he doesn't tend to return my emails. So if you tried to email him, you're in good company. He doesn't return mine either. Um, in fact, he said, Richard, come out next year. Um, I've just come from a conference down the road from where I live, he said, and it's been amazing. He said, I've been with extraordinary people and they're going to get in touch with you and they're going to ask you to come out next year. He said, it'll be okay because we'll spend the weekend together. So I came and I have brought my swimming trunks to spend the weekend with Sir Ken and Sir Ken's in Brazil. <laughs> so frankly, he's not all that. Right, let, let's lay it on the line. And if he's watching online, Ken. Um, <laughs> but it is fantastic to be here. But I, I want to say three things in the few minutes I've got with you this morning. I want to start with this spirit of collaboration and say, you amaze me because this is a Saturday and it's a Saturday morning and none of you had to be here and you are. So don't let any politician, media commentator, ever turn round and question the commitment of teachers and parents to the raising of their children. You're here on a Saturday. And with regard to collaboration, I just want to say that I believe that if we're going to develop an education system that is fit for the 21st century, if we're going to establish a legacy for our children that is fit for their future, then collaboration is everything. And one of the things that fascinates me is the way politicians around the world have become obsessed with the data pumped out by organizations like the OECD and particularly stuff like the PISA league tables. But what they don't commentate on is the underlying message from organizations like the OECD, who when you drill down underneath the data and you talk to people like Andreas Schleicher, who is the author of the PISA reports, about what do the most dynamic education systems really have in common, he says one thing, collaboration. What he'll tell you is that the most dynamic systems on earth have all realized that competitive processes of education where you set schools and communities against each other doesn't work. And the only methodology to drive education forward in the future is collaboration. And when we talk about collaboration, we're not just talking about collaboration between education professionals. And that's why I love this event today because it's about a deeper commitment to collaboration between education professionals and parents, for example. If we live in a world today where you think as a parent, we all are, you can drop your children off at school when they're five or six years of age and pick them up at 18 educated, you are not gonna have a successful 21st century citizen as a child. Secondly, we need to build greater bridges of collaboration between the business sector and education and the cultural sector and education and the charitable sector and education. I am always reminded of that wonderful old African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. So as we go through today and we celebrate the spirit of the gathering here, I want you all to reflect and take the opportunity to meet someone new, to meet someone you don't usually talk to, to harness and bridge a new relationship in the spirit of a greater collaboration. Make that almost the primary goal for today. And so I wanna move on, if it's all right, in the 10 minutes I've got left, to, to get very personal and tell you about two of my educational heroes, so that I can explain to you why I do what I do, and why I passionately believe what I believe. Because we're all shaped by the people we meet along the way. And there are two people in particular I want to tell you about. The first is a man called David Drew Smythe. David was my favorite teacher of all time. I first came across David when I was nine years of age. 
And like many children, tragically, I was the child at the center of a very, very raw divorce battle between my parents. And it affected me deeply, which in a way sometimes when I stand on a stage and talk to people today amazes me. Because if I tell you at 9, 10, 11 years of age, I had a disabling stutter. I couldn't talk to one person, let alone a room full of people. And I had all the other classic symptoms, you know, I was a bedwetter, all of those things. I was a disturbed child because of what was going on at home. And I say this not because of me, but I say this because sadly so many of our children have these underlying issues in their lives. And David Drew Smythe was my savior. David was an English and drama teacher who took the time and trouble to really get to know me as a human being. And of course, what we all know about the greatest teachers, the greatest educators, is they're not there to deliver a syllabus. They're not there to prepare us for exams. They're there to get to know us as human beings. It's what you do every day, isn't it? It's why you get out of bed in the morning. It's that human relationship. Sometimes I wonder whether we've just made education too complicated. You know, there's so much fantastic stuff out there, so much incredible learning, but some of it is really complex. And I just wonder sometimes whether we've overcomplicated the whole issue in order to justify the way we feel about our jobs. And I think we need to strip that back sometimes and remember that education is a series of human interactions. And that we must trust our instincts, just as David did. He got to know me. And he did a crazy thing because he said to me as a young boy, he said, Richard, I'd like you to do drama. I'd like you to audition for the school play. I'd like you on stage. I was stuttering. And he said, no, really. He said, because I think if you're speaking somebody else's words, you might be okay. So I got up on a stage. Now, here's the tragic part for me. And this is actually a double-edged sword about being in LA. I was here um, about two months ago, only in transit. I was on the way to Sydney. And I was at LAX when I got some news because David emigrated at the end of the 1980s to Sydney, Australia. And we were gonna hook up and have a beer because I'd never told him that he'd changed my life. I suppose as a 10-year-old child, you don't know that really, do you? <laughs> By the way, you changed my life. <laughs> so, we were going to hook up, and we are going to meet up for a beer, and I was emailing him a couple of weeks before I left to, on the trip, and there was no reply, which surprised me. And I was at LAX, and I'd been on his Facebook saying, come on, David, where are you? Wake up. And I got a message through Facebook from his daughter to tell me that he died in May. So I never got to tell David to his face. But one of the things I started thinking about, because you know that when you're on your own in particular in a moment like this, you feel you have to communicate to somebody. And you know what it's like in airports. You're not going to go up to the person next to you, are you, in the terminal? Because frankly, they might be a serial killer. Um, <laughs> most of the people I sit next to on a plane, by the way, smell. So... <laughs> um, and I was thinking about what Sarah thought, Facebook. I'm going to say something on Facebook. And um, I thought, what can I say? And on Twitter, what can I say? And I came up with this phrase. And I think it's a great phrase, by the way, not because I made it up, but I just think it's a great reflective phrase. The phrase is, so I put this on Twitter. I said, David Drew Smythe changed the way I viewed the world forever. Now, I don't know about you, but as a teacher, I'd love a student to say that about me. And one of the things I ask you to do as you audit today and audit your practice and audit your relationships with your children as parents and as teachers is how am I affecting the way my child views the world? Which brings me on to my second story, my second hero. And his name is Gary. And Gary was a student in my very first class. We all remember them, don't we? We all remember our very first class. It's funny, isn't it? Because the further away they go, the more rose-tinted your spectacles become. 
I look back on that first class and think they were probably the most idyllic group of children I've ever taught. The truth is, they were monsters, frankly. <laughs> they knew I was a young teacher, or fresh meat, as we were referred to in those days. And I taught in a really tough neighborhood in the center of the UK, in the British Midlands. And I had a class of nine-year-old kids. And Gary was in that first class. And do you remember what it was like when you get your first job in education? It's so exciting. So I got, I got uh, appointed, and I couldn't wait to go in and paint my classroom and put up my first displays, which were triple-backed, by the way. <laughs> Didn't last long. Those same displays were still there when I left the school six years later, but it was a big moment for me. <laughs> and Gary was in that first class, and I got my class list the term before, and I went in so I could meet my new students that were coming to my class. I was so excited. And I went into the staff room, which was filled with the kind of teachers, please don't look at any if they're in the room now, by the way. Don't do that, because I can see you looking, right? It'd be embarrassing. They were filled with teachers who I would best describe as wasp swallowers. You know those people in meetings who do this? And I was so enthusiastic, because I was the young one. You know, I was at least 20 years younger than any other teacher in this school. And I know what they were thinking, we'll crush him. <laughs> and I was going through the call, what's so-and-so like? And they were going, mm, right. And I got to Gary, and I said, what's Gary like? And they said, oh, he's a, he's a lovely boy. Which, of course, we know is code for stupid. <laughs> they said, he's a lovely child. I said, oh, great. He said, no, he is. He's, he's a lovely boy. Of course, academically, he's got no chance. This is true. This is what they say. I mean, and this, these were in the days before we did invented terms for the problems our children have. You know, our kids today are very lucky. They have labels. They're very lucky. They can carry labels around. In those days, you were just stupid or naughty, weren't you? <laughs> Gary wasn't naughty. He was just stupid. And I was told that the thing I needed to do uh, with Gary was keep him happy. Just keep him happy. This was before special needs as well. The school was in a cave. I was in an animal skin. Just keep him happy, they said. So I didn't have great hopes for Gary. But um, I realized within the first two weeks of Gary being in my class that he was quite possibly the most remarkable human being I'd ever met. We had a charity week, you see, first week of the school year. I'm sure lots of people do it to bring the community together. So the school got in a guy who was running a charity called Smiles. And Smiles was raising money. At the time, the scandal had been uncovered in Romania. Do you remember the treatment of Romanian orphans? And he was building a school and a facility for a, a, group, a, a big batch, a group of orphans in a community in Romania. He came in and he was doing this thing on the Monday morning. And then for the rest of the week, we were going to raise money and present him with a, a check on the Friday. And the kids were going to do all sorts of things, right? And one of the things in the UK, as I'm sure you know, we have an obsession with in the UK that most schools have school uniforms, right? And it's at this point you realize that actually British children are daft. Because one of the biggest ways to raise money in British schools with uniforms is allow them to have what we call a non-uniform day, where they pay to wear their own clothes. <laughs> what you have to remember is our, const our constitution isn't written down. Freedoms in the UK are notional. Um, so, so we were on the Friday, we're going to have a non-uniform day, you see, and the kids were going to come in and bring some money and put it in a tin, and this was going to be great. And I, doing the register, and the kids were putting money in a tin, I got to Gary's name. He didn't put money in a tin. I didn't look up. I was too busy doing the uh, register. He came up to the table, and all I heard was thud, right? And I looked up, and he'd put his whole money box on my table. And I counted it up later, by the way. There was about $120. This was a tough community. So this was 20 plus years ago. This was a massive amount of money. I said, you can't give me that money, Gary. And he did that thing. You know when kids are on the verge of either they're going to blow one or they're going to... <laughs> I said, I haven't got time to argue with you now. I, I, I thought, I haven't got time. New teacher. I can't be late for assembly. God help me if I'm late for assembly. <laughs> I'll phone your mother. So 
I shoved the kids into assembly, went downstairs, phoned his mother. She knew it was me. You know, she must have been expecting the call. Mr. Gerva, I said, yes. She said, this is about the money box, isn't it? I said, yes. She said, you've got to take it. I said, we can't. There's $120 in there. She said, you have to. She said, we've been rowing Gary and I all night. And he said to me before he went to bed last night, he said, mum, he said, please, please don't make me spend that money on myself. You see, he'd been saving for a bicycle. His mother had taught him that if you want something in life, you have to earn it. So he'd been saving for a bicycle. He'd been saving his birthday money, his Christmas money. He'd been doing odd jobs in the community. And he said, mum, please don't make me buy that bicycle. I'll never enjoy riding it now, knowing where that money could have gone. I know, remarkable, right? Well, I lost contact with Gary. Can I go on for one more minute and finish this story? Is that all right with everybody? Um, I've come a long way, right? <laughs> God. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so, it's a long way to come back and do the second half of the story, isn't it, frankly? Next year. So, um, so what happened was, we took the money, and the problem was the year later, Gary left elementary school, right? So I thought, I'd n you know the problem, you see these kids, and a lot of them you never see again, right? And you, he was one of those kids that I always wondered, what, what became of Gary? And a remarkable thing happened two and a half years ago when my book was published, because I told that story about Gary in my book as, as one of my personal kind of things about education. And my wife, who's a school principal, on the day after it was published, got a phone call from one of her colleagues, another school principal, who said, I've just read Richard's book. And she said, there's a story about a boy in it called Gary. Is it true? And my wife said, oh, yeah, absolutely. Gary, she said, I thought it was because I think I know Gary now. She thinks, said, I think he goes to my church. Would you mind if I connected the two of them? Because I know Gary would love to see Richard. And of course, my wife knew the same was true the other way around. So we met in a frothy coffee shop. And I don't know what it was. My psyche, I was nervous. I actually had to think about what to wear. And then I got to the frothy coffee shop and I was like, what sort of coffee would Gary expect me to drink? <laughs> Unbelievable, right? And then I'm sat down waiting for a 10-year-old child to walk through the door. The only, realize I re the only way I recognized this six foot two giant of a man was because he, he had um, dyspraxia, right? You know that the motor, and you know a lot of kids with severe dyspraxia walk funny, a bit like a puppet. And I knew it was him because that's how he walked in. So we sat down and we started talking. And I did what any of you would do if you'd not seen a child that you'd really admired for 20 plus years. The first question I asked him, so what became of you? He said, well, I failed secondary school. It won't surprise you because academically he had so many complex problems. He left at 16. I said, what did you do? He said, well, do you remember I was always fascinated by sports? He said, I could never compete equally with other students because of a lot of my complex needs. But I, was, I said, yeah. He said, well, I decided I wanted to get into kind of sport leisure management somehow. So I applied to the local college. I said, what happened? He said, they turned me down. They said, you seem like a nice boy uh, in writing, but we don't think you'll cope with the academic rigors of the course. Now think about what most 16-year-olds would do at that point. He said, I decided if the local college wasn't gonna take me, I'd apply to the biggest college in the country for the same course. He said, but I'd learned. He said, I turned up with my application. I wasn't gonna send it through the post. They had to meet me. I turned up on a Monday morning to see the admissions tutor. I said, what happened? They turned me away, he said. They said, they, the admissions tutor won't see you unless you're accepted for interview. So he said, I didn't give them the form, but I went back on the Tuesday and they turned me away. So I went back on the Wednesday and they turned me away. And I went back on the Thursday, they turned me away. Friday, he said, they were so sick of me. They got, I got to meet the admissions tutor. I got on the course, I did my course. I qualified top of the class. He said, then I found a course in London that ran on Saturdays the following year. He said, then I knew exactly what I wanted to be in my life, but I needed another qualification. So I spent the next year traveling 120 miles down to London every Saturday. I saved up by working during the week to pay for my lodgings and my train fare and my course. And he said, I went down every Saturday and I did this course on a Saturday. This is an 18-year-old student. He said, and I qualify. I said, what did you do? He said, I saw a gap in the market. He said, and I started the business that I still run today. He said, I'm a personal fitness trainer for people with acute physical and mental disabilities. And I'm crying. Now, I'm like, unbelievable. 
I said, what do you do with your spare time? He said, I don't have any, Richard. I run my own business. <laughs> Public sector, private sector. <laughs> I said, what do you do? He said, well, I shut down the business in December because nobody wants to be fit in December, he said. He said, what I do is I take all the profits from my company and I go to a village in West Africa and I spend a month in West Africa training them to do what I do. Now, in my head at this point, you see, because I'm a bit of an egotist, I have now turned this into my story. <laughs> so I asked him the inevitable question. I sat there and I sipped my frothy coffee. And I casually leant back in my big armchair. And I said, who would you say? Anyway, he didn't say me, so I ignored him. I haven't seen him since. <laughs> but here's the point I want to close on. <laughs> David saw something in me that wasn't about academic ability. And Gary taught me that some of the finest minds in our world fail exams. And I would argue to anybody, and maybe you'd like to talk about this as the day goes on, the list of characteristics that Gary had that makes him special. Because I would argue that Gary is quite possibly the perfect example of a 21st century citizen. We have to create an education system that finds all of the millions of Garys in this world if we're to make our world a better place. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.